So uh, I, I wanted to start briefly by, and that's all, okay. <laughs> I wanted to start briefly by giving some examples of the track record of negotiations and then a touch on the PLO and PA response to Trump's declaration and finally discuss some ways to build an alternative future. So it could be said uh, for reasons that Daniel mentioned and others that Israeli-Palestinian negotiations were doomed for the start, from the start. And uh, um, there are several examples of how this worked out uh, or, or uh, several analyses. For example, in, nine, in uh, 2010, my al Shabaka colleague, Camille Mansour, who was part of the Madrid negotiations team, uh, drew on his extensive knowledge of the negotiations to develop several negotiating scenarios relating to key areas of sovereignty. He looked at alliances, crossings, borders, and military outposts, and he showed very clearly that even a moderate Israeli position would come nowhere near securing the goal of a sovereign Palestinian state. In another example, consider the customs union arrangement Israel had with occupied Palestinian uh, territory since uh, as far back as 67, which was institutionalized by the Oslo Accords in 94. Um, again, my colleague Amal Ahmad uh, demonstrates the way in which that was uh, something that was supposed to be a trade, a simple trade arrangement was in fact used by Israel to contain the occupied territories and maintain them without sovereign, uh, sovereignty or rights. So it created in fact what we've had all this time, a no state solution that controlled the territories until Israel could swallow up the West Bank and East Jerusalem and leave Gaza to its fate. So uh, basically while Palestinians pursued negotiations uh, since the 90s and solidified uh, security collaboration with Israel, Israel forged ahead with its colonization of East Jerusalem and the West Bank. Um, this may or may not have been the inevitable conclusion of the peace process, but it is certain that if and when a final status agreement had or could have been reached, Israel would have kept security control over whatever Palestinian state had been established. And even Yitzhak Rabin made that clear. To my mind, what really doomed the Israeli-Palestinian peace process was that the PLO relinquished many of its sources of power as soon as it had opened a line to the United States and never sought to restore these sources of power. So we've uh, mentioned earlier uh, the International uh, Court of Justice Advisory Opinion of 2004 against Israel's separation wall in the West Bank. It could have been used uh, uh, at any time since then and now, it, could ha it, it made a very, very clear call on all states not to recognize the illegal situation arising from the wall um, and not to provide any aid or assistance to uh, uh, states to maintain that situation. So uh, an active PLO would have used, would have pushed rules conscious Europe into end ensuring that their dealings with Israel did not support the legal settlement. So we've wasted between 2004 and now um, uh, because this wasn't used. Even the PLO's success in signing international treaties and gaining full membership, for example, of UNESCO could have been used to exert sovereignty in parts of the occupied Palestinian territories and was never put, used to good effect. So basically, I, I wanted to go through this brief background to show how, how the PLO has left itself with no alternatives to negotiations and uh, almost no sources of power to deal with the Trump declaration on Jerusalem and moving the embassy there on Nakba Day. Uh, PLO Chairman uh, Mahmoud Abbas has attempted to deal with the Trump administration, has, uh, as has been said, by saying the US is out, we don't, don't want to deal with it anymore, and seeking alternatives to US mediation of the peace process by visiting Russia, France, uh, and other countries. And of course, the countries Abbas made, uh, visited made it clear that they were unwilling to step forward to play a leading role, and that the US must maintain uh, a role in the process. And you think about it, well, why should they step forward? Uh, the PLO has no power to make them do so and nothing to offer in return. The European Union should be the power most concerned with what Israel is doing to the system of international law because the European uh, Union counts on that system of international law which has protected it since uh, the Second World War. But it's beset by internal problems. And as I said, the PLO has no power uh, to ask it 
uh, to, do, to do anything and has, has not been active. Here in the UK, as has been noted, uh, uh, relations with Israel are being strengthened as, as we speak. And indeed, uh, if you look at today's Haaretz, or maybe it was yesterday, uh, in, in reference to Prince William's upcoming visit, it, it said that the Brit British-Israeli relationship is actually slanted in Israel's favor and that the upcoming royal visit is intended to strengthen, trans strengthen Britain's position on the world stage, which picks up on what Daniel was saying about where the trajectory has gone in Israel's favor. Now, to my mind, it was a small thing, but the most significant PLO response to Trump's move on Jerusalem was the Central Council's long overdue official support and call for adoption of the Palestinian-led uh, global movement for boycott, divestment, and sanctions at its meeting in January. The Central Council, of course, repeated its calls for other measures by the PLO, uh, such as an end to the security coordination, uh, none of which uh, with Israel, uh, uh, none of which were done, and actually steps which are not really doable in the PLO's present position of weakness. By contrast, the official adoption of BDS is, is significant because it's a belated recognition of the need for some sources of power, and also recognition, one hopes, that there's considerable power in Palestinian and global civil society. So it's this reality of, of that kind of power that helps us map the way forward, despite the grim history and background uh, that we faced. And this is, it's this source of power which enables me to remain actually optimistic about the Palestinian struggle for rights. If we can maneuver ourselves into a position of power, both at the national level, even with a weak leadership, and at the level of civil society. So I want to list four key actions uh, that people could consider. First, the, the imperative to keep as many Palestinians as possible, as safe as possible, on both sides of the Green Line, both within the occupied territories and within Israel. An assumption is often made that Palestinians will be the majority in an apartheid state or in a one-state solution. But you can be sure if you've made this assumption, Israel has thought of it too and is working hard to reverse it. There are grand sweeping plans for dispossession. For example, the National Union Party wants to annex the occupied territories and make Palestinians choose either to give up their national aspirations and get a generous package to emigrate, or to be handled with even greater force than at present. And you, you can imagine uh, what that would be like given what's being done today. And then there's the day-to-day -day small scale but inexorable dispossession on both sides of the Green Line, which I think my El Shabaka colleague Munir Nusayba, who has written several pieces on how, on decades of Israel's dispossession and how it does it, will be speaking about in the next panel. Um, I'm going to interrupt my flow here just to say I've mentioned Al Shabaka a couple of times. We're a Palestinian think tank with a, a transnational reach, and I encourage you to join our email list for the best. Um, uh, uh, and most rigorous Palestinian policy analysis. Um, so, uh, and I also want to say something a bit unusual here, which is in the context of uh, keeping Palestinians on their land, uh, do pray for Abbas's long life and health, because despite the huge mistakes that the PA has made, especially in terms of security cooperation, its shameful treatment of Gaza, you could go on and on, what comes after Abbas is likely to be much worse, and there are plans to replace or even eliminate him. So that's the first key action, is keeping Palestinians on their land. The second action is the recognition, uh, and, and I urge that, th that there be such a recognition amongst Palestinians and their allies, that either political outcome, one state or two, can be made to work in a way that upholds Palestinian rights. So we should avoid fixating on state outcomes and on building up our sources of power. The fact that Palestine is now a member of the state system, even as a non-member observer state, is a source of power for Palestinians. It doesn't mean don't work for one state. It doesn't mean you know, don't work for two states. But it is an actual source of power. It's not being effectively used. But our response should not be to let it go, but rather to put pressure on the PLO to use that source of power to full effect. Israel has been trying to, to erase the green line for decades. We've had a lot of discussion about the green line, which was originally uh, different, uh, 
uh, in different places, but uh, we, uh, Israel has been trying to erase the green line for decades and we shouldn't help it to do so. The success of the BDS movement itself is in large part because most of the people in US and Europe who support boycotts target Israel's illegal settlements beyond the green line and other activities beyond the green line. The road ahead is still very long. No one is any, in any rush at the moment at the state level to help Palestinians fulfill their rights. So there's no need to decide right now on the ultimate political outcome. Work for either, but focus on the sources of power you need to get there. Third, I think we need to keep our eyes on hope because this is a grim and long business that we're in. And there are many long-term trends in this conflict that are sources of hope. And Daniel has mentioned one that I, I always, often turn to myself, um, which, is, uh, which actually I think predates uh, the Trump administration and, and came about because of Israel's repeated attacks on Gaza, um, which has led a, a quickly growing, sm small, but, but not that small. I mean, an organization like Jewish Voice for Peace in, in the States has about 200,000 people on its, on its email list. And, and this change uh, uh, of, uh, amongst Jews who are now mobilized to work for human rights um, uh, and, and for Palestinian rights in what is now a very strong, as part of what's a very strong US-Palestine solidarity movement is a big shift and a big source of power. There are also growing rifts between the mainstream Jewish community and Israel uh, because uh, Israel is beginning to treat reform and conservative Jews who account for uh, uh, two thirds of US Jews and, and seems to be putting all its bets on Orthodox Jews. They're beginning to treat the reform and conservative Jews a bit like second class Jews. So shifts like this, which are also happening in the Democratic Party, will over time erode political and military support that Israel receives from the US and uh, uh, generate a shift in the political power. So, and fourth, last but not least, we need a unifying vision for the Palestinian people. Attention, when we talk about unifying the Palestinian people, attention is usually fixated on uh, Fatah and Hamas reconciliation, which is important, but for many reasons has been and is likely to continue to be elusive. We can sidestep this obstacle by having a, a unifying vision that enables all Palestinians and their allies to work towards the same goals, whether in refugee camps, in exile, under siege, under occupation, or, uh, in, and under occupation, or in Israel. And I want to stress here the importance of the Palestinian citizens of Israel, and not just because uh, Dr. Tibi is here. Uh, the Palestinian citizens of Israel know it better than any of us. And some of them are amongst our best strategic thinkers. And when you think back to 2006, in those years where they were preparing uh, the future vision document, and uh, in, in which there was a strong call on Israel to become the state of all its citizens. Th th uh, th uh, that's the kind of strategic thinking that we need uh, for, for this movement. A unifying Palestinian narrative actually already exists that is not tied uh, to uh, political outcomes because we're not at the stage where we can decide or, or do anything about a political outcome. That unifying narrative is that Palestinians should work for freedom, justice, and equality which are the goals identified by the BDS movement and their goals that all Palestinians can aspire to and support. Each one of those goals to speak to each, uh, to one of the three segments of the Palestinian people. Uh, freedom speaks to freedom from occupation. Uh, justice speaks to equality for the Palestinian citizens of Israel. Uh, sorry, justice speaks to, to the right of return for refugees and equality speaks to equality for the Palestinian citizens of Israel. The problem now is that uh, the goals are subsumed, they're not clear. I think it needs, for, for several reasons, those goals need to be now placed front and center because they offer a, a compelling vision, a positive vision that can quickly occupy the hard ground. Currently, the Palestinians and their allies are defined by what they're against, against apartheid, uh, uh, you know, against Israel, against this, against that. We need to be identified more by what we're for. We're for freedom, we're for justice and equality. And those three goals can be achieved in one state or two. Thank you very much.